I would now love to invite Dr. Matt Becker um, to come to the stage and tell you all about the Zambian Carnival Program. So welcome, Matt. First time to this continent. So I was talking to a very close friend of mine who was explaining why her relationship just broke down uh, with her boyfriend had to do with her pet dog and uh, said, well, he seemed to like it. And she said, well, the world said something approximately like the world can be broken down into three different types of people. People who don't like dogs, people who like dogs, and dog people. So I'm very happy to be amongst my people tonight and uh, want to talk to you about the, the dog work that we do in Zambia, both on the, the dogs themselves, on the conservation uh, issues facing them, and on the, the wide breadth of activities that we do, not only as an organization, but with all a number of organizations and individuals throughout the country and throughout the world. Uh, wild dogs, as you know, are, are one of Africa's most endangered large carnivores, unfortunately. And I'm sure you've heard these statistics before, maybe seen this map before. Uh, for those of you who haven't been, this is Africa. Um, and uh, wild dogs, unfortunately, like, like so many of these current and historic ranges of, of animals in Africa and throughout the world, have declined dramatically. There's only two regions left on the continent in sub-Saharan Africa that, that have dogs, that being southern Africa and eastern Africa. And you can see Zambia is kind of right in the middle of, of those two regions. And Zambia, in addition to uh, Tanzania, which is estimated to have about 18, 1,800 dogs, uh, Zambia was estimated in 2007 to have about 430. Namibia, about 400. Botswana, about 800. South Africa, about 400, that's since gone down. Uh, Zimbabwe, about 600. Uh, these numbers have, have been changed uh, with, with more information. I'll get to that later. But, but basically, dogs are few and far between. There's very few countries that have them anymore. You can also see that, that uh, PDC Incorporated supports uh, at least half of these countries. And uh, in, in general, Zambia is one of the least known of these six countries, and uh, we, we hope to set a convincing case for its importance in wild dog conservation and conservation in general. Zambia is a, a pretty large country by uh, Southern African standards. It has one of the lowest population densities uh, in the region, about 11 million people, most of which are concentrated in the capital city and uh, in, the, in the mining areas. And as I, as I mentioned, the, the estimates of dogs were about 430, and the regions being Kafui and eastern Zambia having the largest. And again, virtually nothing is known about these populations. Uh, the work of Kelly Lee, who PDC supported, uh, African wild dog conservation being uh, the vast majority of our knowledge on that, and this work has obviously stemmed from that. Um, the overall objective of our organization is to pr uh, protect and restore carnivores and the populations and ecosystems in which they reside. And uh, why carnivores? Well, obviously for a number of reasons. First off, ecologically, they occupy a, a very important niche as top predators. They're cool, they're charismatic and high profile, and that's probably why most of us are here. They're just really intriguing animals. Uh, and as a consequence, they're economically important. From an ecosystem protection uh, perspective, even in good naturally governed populations, they're low density and wide ranging. So basically the importance of huge connected ecosystems cannot be underscored uh, with carnivore conservation. And, and the reason being is because of human cause edge effects, which you may be familiar with. This is a sophisticated digital rendering of South Luanga National Park, which I made. And uh, these are a variety of, of human edge effects, uh, which can affect not only wild dogs, uh, but large carnivores and wildlife in general. And in the extreme, can affect them to such an extent that the, that the uh, viability of the protected area itself is compromised, and these species can actually go extinct within a protected area. And unfortunately, that has happened in a number of national parks uh, within and around the region. 
Zambia, unlike a lot of countries uh, in the continent and, and elsewhere, uh, has one thing that's, that's incredibly positive uh, in that it has a huge land mass managed for wildlife. Nearly one third of the country is managed in the form of national parks or game management areas. This is a map of the areas we currently work in Zambia, and the green is national parks, the red or the sort of tannish pink are game management areas, which are communally owned lands. And you can see these are massive, unfenced, connected areas. Uh, the eastern Zambia on the far right is 72,000 square kilometers. Banguela wetlands up above it. Kafui ecosystem, one of the largest parks around at 22,000, just the park. And on the border of Angola, uh, Lua Plain National Park. And these border six different, po uh, six different countries. So the possibility not only for wild dog conservation in these areas, but also transboundary wild dog conservation with neighboring populations is huge. But tonight I want to focus on just the uh, three national parks that, that we work in and around. And I should mention that these are the major wild dog populations in the country. So we currently work on essentially all of the wild dog populations there. And like anywhere, there's a number of conservation and management challenges. Uh, to sum up this list, basically very little is known and what is known is uh, not effectively applied in conservation and management uh, actions. And so that's one of our main roles. I think one of the unique things, while we uh, are working on dogs, and that is the majority of what I'm talking about, one of the unique things is a multi-predator focus. So uh, you probably know that all of these animals occur in, in African ecosystems. Uh, most of them, and they actually compete to varying degrees. So for example, this is uh, another sophisticated diagram I made with the, uh, the red arrows or orange arrows meaning negative influences and the blue either meaning positive influences or, or an unknown. And essentially, you can look at lions. They have a negative impact on dogs, hyenas, cheetah, leopards, uh, and, and a lot of the blue could be where for example, wild dogs may have a positive impact by providing food uh, to hyenas from kills. Um, a lot of th these uh, interactions are poorly understood as well. But essentially, if you're going to study animals such as wild dogs, you better know what's going on with the lions and the hyenas. Uh, similar things go for cheetah. Leopards are a bit of an unknown. But essentially, given that so little is known about these ecosystems and so many interactions are likely to be important uh, between these species, we've had a, a unique opportunity to work on the predator guilds in each system. And these effects uh, that I'm talking about, competitive effects, can vary. They can be direct effects, so like predation. And predation, I'm not talking about actually eating things, but it's uh, animals killing each other. And it's thought to be that, uh, well, in the case of dogs and, and lions, it's maybe a dog and cat thing. This is a, a uh, hyena and cat thing. Uh, but um, So direct predation on adults and cubs and, and pups is a big influence in, in many ecosystems. Uh, kleptoparasitism, that's stealing of kills, uh, that is not an unusual thing in a lot of systems. And I should emphasize this is all natural. This isn't something bad, these interactions. But it's something we have to pay attention to. Uh, this is a hyena that's taken a, a dog kill. And just harassment between the different species uh, that, that can occur and affect interactions. In addition, there's indirect effects because of these. So uh, this can be habitat avoidance by certain species. This is a, a data map in South Luanga. You can see the uh, Luanga River, which is actually not neon yellow. Um, in the middle, and those location points are lion prides, so the green and red are, are lion prides, and they're right along the river, and then you have wild dog locations sort of off that. Uh, so this can lead uh, to, to dynamics that can increase the effect of, of human impacts in that there's villages on the right side of the river uh, that can have disease transmission from domestic dogs, allow the dogs to get into more snaring uh, danger, and all of these can can uh, impact dog populations as a whole. So as a consequence, we work on dogs, lions, hyenas, cheetah, and leopards in, uh, to varying degrees depending on the project and the ecosystem. And we have a three-tiered approach. First off, as I mentioned, research. Uh, we are, first and foremost, a research project aimed at identifying and describing and evaluating the dynamics, limiting factors, and threats for all of this. When you go to Zambia, some of the most fundamental knowledge is lacking. 
namely how many, where are they, what are they doing to, to generalize. Uh, obviously, if we only describe this and evaluated it, that's not good enough. There are some immediate conservation threats, many of which John identified and, and described in his talk, and we can't stand idle and, and not do anything about it. So what we call our conservation approach is to address immediate threats. And lastly, and perhaps most importantly, if we only do this amongst ourselves and, and don't allow for an insurance that this is something that will be carried on by the people ultimately most responsible for conservation of their wildlife, namely the Zambian nationals, uh, then we, we haven't accomplished anything. And so that's our approach. And our structure is the program oversees four main projects and uh, then works with a number of collaborating agencies, organizations, and institutions from around the world uh, to construct uh, cohesive uh, collaborative teams that have a variety of expertise, experience, and skills and resources uh, to address all these issues. And our approach in these systems is a system-wide approach where we try and address how many animals and, and what their distribution is, and then also intensive studies of, of individuals. So now I just want to jump through a couple of our, of our projects. This is first going from west to east. Uh, this is Lua Plain, uh, which has also been called Zambia Serengeti. This is where that motorcycle went, and it's a fantastic place, but it is the most logistically challenging place I've ever worked in. Uh, it was on the border, it still is actually on the border of Angola, <laughs> and, uh, at, least, at least when I left. Um, and uh, it suffered massive prey depletion from the Angolan Civil War uh, during the last couple decades. And an um, uh, organization you may know of, African Parks, took over management in 2005 as part of a public-private 25-year partnership aimed at restoring the area. And this is the, the wildebeest migration, second largest wildebeest migration on the continent, has grown from 15 to 40,000 animals in the last five years, growing at 20% a year. We also work through my university, uh, Montana State University, with African Parks on developing some wildebeest work. This is just preliminary data, uh, actually to my knowledge, the only data on this wildebeest migration. Uh, this is simply GPS collar uh, points from a collared wildebeest cow. And you can see up in the upper left, this is uh, the Angolan border up there. So they're not actually going into Angola yet, but this is part of the Lua Masuma Transfrontier Conservation Area. And the ultimate goal is to restore this migration way up into Angola, where it's thought to historically have occurred. And so in 2010, we formed with African Parks the Lua Plain Carnivore Project. And this is a very unique project on several levels. Uh, the, the main one being, as I talked about with these competitive interactions, this area is essentially devoid of lions. And so the hyenas have had it good for a long time. There's a lot of hyenas in the, in the area. And so the hyenas have uh, essentially, we're not sure if they've actually been released from lion predation or whether they're just going to be that abundant. Uh, we'll know when the lion populations actually begin to grow. But one of the advantages that we have now, and here's the lion uh, population, it's, it's at three. So we have an excellent idea of the lion population. It's very well described and uh, very well estimated. Uh, I don't know if you've heard of Lady Lua, the last lioness of, of Lua, and two males were reintroduced, and you can just see they've, they've ranged a bit over the, the park. But essentially, the wild dogs, it was thought that there were no wild dogs in the park until recently a pack showed up several years ago. And then uh, myself and the, the park manager managed to set a land speed record for collaring uh, dog packs with two dog packs in two and a half hours um, in, uh, one day when they both showed up. Uh, since then, we've estimated the dog population at at least three packs and uh, seem to be growing quite uh, rapidly. And we think that's possibly as a result of the lack of, of lion predation, given that that can be a limiting factor. Uh, this is this New Year's crop, uh, the pack, the main pack in the south is 17 animals with 10 new pups. And just photograph these before, um, and I just throw this picture in as a in, uh, point of interest. This is a uh, spitting cobra that came near the den and the alpha female actually attacked it and actually did get sprayed, but effectively deterred it from going anywhere near the pups and just demonstrates the uh, ten tenacity of, of wild dogs and, and again, how close-knit a cohesive unit they are. 
Um, unfortunately, at this time, I just got an email recently that a bushfire has burned through the den, and we're not sure what the actual fate of the pups are. Hopefully, they've moved them, but they haven't found them yet. So, uh, Lua, again, is a, is a wild dog population in transition, but hopefully will become one of the, the major uh, dog populations in the region. Similarly, Zambia cheetah populations are recovering in the area, and uh, they are, are found in Lua and Kafui, and uh, very little known about them. And we've just received uh, funding from National Geographic Big Cats Initiative to do a distribution survey of cheetah, wild dog, lion, and hyena in the region. And given that they're incredibly difficult to do surveys on, we're employing a never-before-used technique on these species of detection dogs. And these are scat-sniffing dogs similar to uh, bomb sniffing or narcotics dogs, and uh, they will hopefully be the scat finders and give us a very good idea of the populations and dynamics of all those species. Jumping over to Kafui ecosystem, again this is one of the largest tracts in the left in, in continent of, uh, of connected uh, wildlife land. And we're currently doing a photo survey of the whole area. It was estimated there's 200 dogs in the 2007 census. Uh, Robin Lines and his wife Anna uh, got in there in May and have since recorded, I think, 110 dogs just in our area. So if we break over 200, I think that makes Kafui the most wild dogs of any national park in Africa. So uh, we're very excited about that, and we haven't even gotten going yet. And um, now jumping over to Luanga, uh, this is the current wild dog information for our study area in the central uh, part of Loanga. Again, the 2007 estimates were 100 dogs. We've got over 200 in the last three years. So that's very promising. Not necessarily an increase versus a better description of the population. And what we're also finding is that dogs are resident throughout that region. Uh, they're recorded in all the game management areas. We uh, just met with folks at Flinders University who uh, we'll be doing some work with given that we just had some dogs move up along the border of Malawi, and Malawi is starting to find dogs, so we think there's a, a sourcing of dogs from Zambia into Malawi. And uh, basically dogs are being recorded in areas that they were previously absent, and we're not sure why they were absent. Could be related to disease, uh, lion dynamics, snaring, a number of different things. Unfortunately, one of the concerning dynamics with wild dogs in the Luanga are small pack size, so about five to seven dogs, that's right on what's considered viable. Low dispersal success, so we have a lot of dogs moving around but not effectively forming packs. High pack turnover, so we're finding dogs that are uh, either breaking away from the packs or actually disappearing altogether or dying and low pup production. And obviously naturally uh, that might have to do with competitive interactions. I'll go into what we think it is in a moment. But we also study, since mid-2009, uh, intensive studies of the Loanga Valley lions. This is the most important lion population in the country. We have a study population of 16 prides and 8 coalitions, and uh, 151 individually identifiable animals. And uh, I'm not the poor person who has to identify them by their whisker spot patterns, but uh, that's Eggle. But uh, so we have a, a pretty good idea of, of the lion and dog population. And now getting back to something John touched on, uh, what we think is the reason for decline, similar to other regions in Zimbabwe and throughout Zambia, uh, unfortunately wire snare poaching seems to have a very big impact. Uh, this slide, sad to say, was about a month's worth of work last year. So these are all the animals, not even all the animals that were desnared in one small area in, in one month of work in last October. Uh, it's thought that snaring has um, been the cause of decline in at least two breeding packs in the game management areas. A uh, recent evaluation of our data shows 75% of the packs have a snared individual in them or have had, and that's approximately 6 to 20%, depending on the year of each pack snared, and obviously the, likely, the actual rate is much higher. Since June uh, 2009, 20% of the adult male lions in the study area have been snared, and obviously there's not a lot of adult male lions um, in, in some of these areas as they're, they're harvested, and approximately 12% uh, is the uh, estimate of the whole population. In addition, just a number of other animals. Uh, poaching of elephants, when snaring is included, increases 33% over the last five years. 
Uh, we work with SLCS, and this is Rachel McRobb, whom PGC and Pursue support. Uh, we work closely with, with their organization to uh, look at snaring trends and patterns. And this is the, the Wild Dog anti-snaring team. These are some trends over the last couple of years. Uh, from Rachel's data, you can see a pretty big peak in dry season snaring. Um, the, the causes of that and the dynamics of that are still a bit unclear, and so we've also been funded uh, by National Geographic Big Cats Initiative to uh, evaluate snaring tr uh, trends and patterns um, using data from the wild dog team, a newly created lion team, and a general data to address these, these uh, patterns and trends in poaching and hopefully uh, provide more effective uh, anti-poaching work and, and stem snaring. Just running through some more things. Uh, we do extensive vaccination programs in Luanga and Lua, supported through PDC. And then all of this information goes into risk mapping of these areas to determine how viable they are, and also provide current and extensive evaluations of them. We do species reintroductions. We'll be reintroducing two lions into uh, uh, Lua for Lady Lua uh, this year, with luck. And now I just want to run through our capacity building and education initiatives quickly. We work with Chip and Bailey Wildlife Educational Trust. This is getting repetitive, but again, through PDC supported work. Uh, we work with the Mfui Secondary School to implement some work uh, aimed at basically getting students in the conservation club better versed in our work and hopefully employing and educating them in the future. We're currently working on camera trapping research, and this is a uh, upper left. This is a computer uh, room that's built at Mfui Secondary. We fund computer training, the instructor, uh, full-time, year-round instructor, and the kids are involved currently in, in conducting their own scientific research uh, with the vehicle provided by uh, uh, Sydney and Sue Chip Chase, and uh, I think there's some pictures of that. And so uh, we've done a lot of work with that. And this, we have a Friday Bush School, uh, a computer training scholarship program, and ultimately we, we employ the students as well. This is just the Lavanga Valley Mon Carnivore Monitoring Program. It's a guide run pro uh, program. A University of Zambia Internship Program. We have graduate education, two new Zambian graduate students, most recently a Fulbright Scholar to Montana State uh, to study with Scott Creel in part working on wild dogs, and Jaseela Masoka who runs the Lua project. We work with Zawa closely, seconding a number of their uh, employees. And then obviously over half of our staff are uh, Zambian locals, and we do a number of, of different educational initiatives with them anywhere from training them in computers to teaching them how to drive, which is interesting. And I'd just like to, rec uh, to recognize uh, our support throughout our number of projects, and in particular, <coughs> recognize uh, Painted Dog Conservation Incorporated for all their assistance. I hope I've got it all on here. Uh, John mentioned the, the immense amount of money everyone provides. And in particular, I'd, I'd like to recognize uh, John and Ange as well. Um, you see a lot of what they do, but uh, it's unbelievable amount, and, and I think it's incredibly inspiring. As Tony mentioned, sometimes Africa can seem like one big tragedy, but I think uh, if you're a committed group of, of people like yourselves, um, we can help make uh, Africa's wildlife uh, and future a, a good, uh, good place. So thank you very much. Yeah.